right, thanks for joining us on today's edition of Titan Leader Talks. Today we have the opportunity to uh, discuss some things with Coach Jim Tressel. Coach, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. So looking at your resume, um, you know, obviously you served as an assistant coach, then you were a head coach at Youngstown State, won a couple national titles, then came over to Ohio State, won a national title, and currently you're the uh, president of Youngstown State University. So obviously you have this very impressive resume, and, and we're really excited to have you. Um, so maybe could you take us through that journey a little bit and how you, you, you know, have reached some of those uh, positions of prominence? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting, Brent. Uh, when I was in high school, behaved myself, whatever, uh, then I had to start thinking about, you know, what was it I'd like to do? And that's kind of new when you're young because, you know, the, the future when you're young is, is this week, you know, next weekend, that type of thing. And uh, so I started thinking about it going into my senior year of high school when they started saying, do you want to go to college? Do you want to go to the service? You know, do you want to go to the trades? You know, what do you want to do? And uh, I was fortunate I grew up in a coaching family. My father was a head coach in high school for 10 years and then a head coach in college for 23. So I got to watch that day in and day out. I had two older brothers who decided to go into education. Uh, one ended up being a longtime Division III head coach, my brother Dick, and, and then he ended up being on our staff actually at Ohio State. Um, and my middle brother, I was the youngest, and he was an educator, so I watched both of them uh, seek to go into education. So education became my interest. I went to college, and uh, by the time I was done with college, I was sold on teaching. I could teach uh, both health, phys ed, and math. And so I thought, well, that would be you know, a good resume to perhaps get a teaching job, and decided to go on to graduate school with the goal being I would get my master's, and then I would go and try to be a high school coach. And I was young and silly enough to think I could be a head coach, you know, at age 23 or something like that. And, and uh, so I started applying for these head coaching jobs while I was in um, graduate school. And one thing led to another. And our head coach at the University of Akron, Jim Dennison, uh, who was a great influence on me, uh, asked me if I'd like to join his staff. And I really was thinking I wanted to teach and coach in high school, um, what's loves and jobs and so forth. Uh, that I was seeking in high school rank. So I thought, well, yeah, I don't, I'm gonna be unemployed here after graduate school, so I might as well accept this job. And, and uh, so I worked for three more years with Coach Dennison and really kind of fell in love with, with uh, teaching and coaching. And back in those days, college coaches taught classes as well. It's a little different than it is today, but we taught all of the health and physical education classes. And so I really enjoyed that. And, after four years at the University of Akron, uh, had the opportunity to be invited to go to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And, and uh, that was the first time that I went and I was just coaching. And I wasn't sure if I loved just coaching, not that you know, coaching is uh, a limited thing, but uh, I really enjoyed the classroom. Uh, but uh, I kept grinding away and working hard. And I spent two years there at Miami, was invited to go to Syracuse University for a couple of years. And, worked for Dick McPherson there. And so having watched my dad for all those years and then Jim Dennison at Akron and then Tom Reed at Miami and then Dick McPherson uh, at Syracuse, I really got the bug for the college coaching thing. And I kind of uh, didn't think much about uh, missing the teaching that I hoped I could do. And, and then went to Ohio State with Earl Bruce and spent three years there. And uh, so after 11 years as an assistant coach, I thought, well, let me let me start thinking about maybe I could be a head coach. And, and uh, so I was fortunate to come here to Youngstown State in 1986 as the head coach. But one thing I was able to add uh, to my duties is I uh, went back into the classroom. So every year that I was at Youngstown State for 15 years and then Ohio State for 10, I always taught a class. And it really kind of revved up my input to teaching. I enjoyed the students and I loved my players and so forth. But you know, you have a hundred guys and you spend hours and hours with them. It was kind of fun to get a different group of people to learn from and, and uh, get a, a wider context of, of what's important to young people. And, and uh, so then when I was done in the coaching side of things, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do and was fortunate to go to uh, University of Akron as a vice president 
and really get into the education sector on a broad uh, sense and spent two years there as the vice president. And I'm just finishing my uh, sixth year here as the president of Youngstown State. And, and what is interesting, you asked the question of, you know, how did you progress? And what was funny was in none of the situations I was in, was I ever looking for the next one? Uh, my motto was always paradise is where I am. I'm going to, students I have, the players I have, the community I live in, the institution I'm working for. And, and uh, if I stay there the rest of my life, that's great. And uh, if opportunities, you know, come my way, I'll evaluate those. And, and uh, so uh, in, in no case, even people used to always say, Brent, that when we got to Ohio State as the head coach, well, that was always your dream job and so forth. Honestly, it wasn't my dream job. I, my dream job was the job I was in. And one thing led to another. And uh, as timing would have it, and I would say to any listener out there, timing is critical in everything you do. Um, it just so happened when the Ohio State job opened up there in uh, January of 2001, I think what they were really looking for was someone who had spent a lot of time in Ohio. And I had spent 26 years coaching in Ohio, visiting the high schools, knew, you know, most everyone in the coaching realm and, and uh, appreciated them and, and learned from them and worked with them and studied with them. And, and so the timing was right that uh, Ohio State just wanted someone uh, who was a little bit steeped in the Ohio traditions. And uh, so that, that's how I ended up being there. It wasn't that I had a master plan that plotted the steps toward getting to Ohio State or anything. And, and, and I would have never dreamed I'd be a president of a university. I certainly didn't have a plan for that. Uh, but timing was interesting here. Uh, I had been here for 15 years and then gone for 14. Uh, and they had gone through three presidents in a four-year period. And they were really just looking for someone who knew the place, who uh, everyone knew would love being at the place because I enjoyed every day of the first 15 years I'd been there. And, and so the timing was right. I'm sure I had experience, know-how or the talent or whatever to do it, but the timing was right. And uh, I, I've certainly enjoyed uh, every minute here as the president. It's much broader than what I was doing as a coach because I used to have a hundred guys and a dozen coaches and really focused on that. Um, then I got here and I had 12,000 students and 2,000 employees and six different colleges plus an athletic department and a school of music and uh, all that type of thing. But uh, uh, timing is important. And I think being focused on where you are uh, at the very moment, one of the things we talked about with our players often was focus on the moment. Focus on what you're doing right now. In fact, the best advice that I got from a, a mentor when I got to the University of Akron as a graduate assistant, he said, you have to meet the athletic legendary guy. He had been a great high school coach in Ohio and, and had been an assistant coach for Woody Hayes. And he was the head coach at the University of Akron. And now at that point, he was the AD. And he called me in for my meeting with him. And I was warned that it was going to be a short meeting, that he wasn't a real conversational guy. And uh, they said, so don't sit down because it's not going to be that kind of meeting. So I walked in and stood there and he looked at me and he said, I only have one piece of advice for you. Keep your mind and your rear end in the same place. Where you are is where you have to focus. And he didn't say it exactly that way. He had he was a little more graphic in his, uh, in his uh, suggestion, but from the moment I heard that, it made perfect sense to me. And uh, you know, I've tried to follow that uh, thought throughout my entire career. Those are some great pieces of advice and probably more relevant today than ever, um, especially with social media and phones. And yeah. I know one of the slogans in our program is uh, be where your feet are, you know, so yeah. very, very similar. Um, yeah. So, 
So, Coach, I, I will tell you, when I was a uh, much younger coach and just getting into the profession, uh, it kind of coincided with the release of your book, The Winner's Manual, or The Winner's Manual. I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, for those people that aren't familiar with it, if you're looking for a, a biography or stories about Ohio State, it's not exactly that kind of book. I mean, this thing was written as almost like a, a program guide or like a, an instructional manual almost. And, um, you know, at the Titan app, we're doing something similar. We're just digitizing it. And you walk through um, goal setting. You walk through, you know, the block of life. Maybe take us through the evolution of this book because this is the Ohio State version of it. Um, I believe the first one was released in 1986 to Youngstown State, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Well, it was interesting. After spending 11 years as an assistant coach, and one thing, uh, as an assistant coach, you always think you have all the answers that you know more than your head coach. And then all of a sudden, I became a head coach, and I realized, oh, my gosh, there's so much I don't know. I don't even know what I don't know. And so as I was working with my staff, and I was a young guy, I don't know, 32, 33 years old, and, and I was trying to think, okay, what are we going to do? Now I'm the head coach. I'm supposed to uh, have all the answers, and I really don't. I would go out recruiting and would be doing all the things that, you know, I knew that you had to do. But whenever I was in the car, I was always to the table, other coaches. I was always trying to glean. <clears throat> I had watched what my dad did, and I'd watched what my four head coaches had done. And I didn't want to copy any of them uh, because, you know, there were – you know, a lot of the things I liked about what they did, but there were some things that I didn't think fit my personality or maybe didn't fit uh, the program that we had in mind. And, and so one day I was pulling up to a high school and I was listening to a tape uh, and it was Hayden Fry, who at the time was the coach at the University of Iowa. And he went to Iowa when they weren't doing very well at all. And he built an amazing program. And the thing that he talked about in the tape <clears throat> was – when he got to Iowa, they hadn't won much. They weren't really doing as well as anyone would like academically, socially. So he said, the thing I did was I created a course on winning. Well, my educational uh, mind started flowing and, and that's what I love doing is, is teaching and courses and, and helping people grow. And, and uh, so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna create a course on winning and I wanted to be winning in all phases of life. And we're going to create a manual. And in our winner's manual, part of it was our organizational expectations that we had for our student athletes, whether it be time schedules or clients type things or whatever. But then probably two thirds of the manual was built around what we called the wheel of life, which at Ohio State, we called the block O of life. And it took six major components in one's development that we were going to pledge to them that we were going to get better in all these areas. And so in 1986, the manual was 70 pages long, and every team that we used it with wanted to add to it. They wanted to give other information and other thoughts that helped them along the way and that they wanted to help teams down the way. So I'd say by the time... We left Youngstown State after 15 years. It was, I don't know, between two and 300 pages long. And, and then it, it, it started getting bigger and bigger. And, and every year I would try to thin it out a little bit just to help the budget because it wasn't an app. You know, it was a, we were printing it. We didn't have any money. And, and so I remember one year at Ohio State, I thought, man, this thing's getting over 400 pages because everyone's got great things they want to add and they want to share with others and add value to the team. And, and uh, but I've got to thin this out. I mean, this book is just too big. So I spent one whole summer really thinning it out, trying to, you know, be cognizant of what people recently had given me because I didn't want them to think we didn't feel as if their information was important. And so we got into preseason and I'll never forget one night, uh, we had finished our evening meetings and we spent a lot of time working with our winner's manual in the evening with our teams. And, and Bobby Carpenter came into my office. He said, Hey coach, what's going on here? I said, well, what's wrong, Bobby? And he said, well, man in the glass is missing, not in the winner's manual. I said, well, 
Bobby, you know, I, I've been going through and some things that have been in there for 20 years, I've kind of thinned out and the man in the glass was a, a poem that uh, some of our guys liked that, that uh, I said, you know, it's been in there 20 years. And I thought, well, let me keep the newer stuff in there. And he said, no, you have to have the man in the glass. He said, that I go to every preseason when I'm struggling, when things aren't going the way I want to, when my attitude's starting to go the wrong direction. He said, I would always go back to the man in the glass because I knew it was what I needed to do. And I couldn't blame it on others. I couldn't uh, complain that my coach didn't like me or I wasn't getting an opportunity or whatever. You must have the man in the glass in this winner's manual. So, of course, the next year, you know, I, I went back and I made sure that, that uh, the man in the glass was in there, but also some of the things I thinned out. And I think by the time we were done at Ohio State, our winner's manual was probably between four and 500 pages long. Um, I constantly get calls from former players. Hey, I lost my winner's manual. Can you send me another one? And, and I had had some leftovers over the years, but gosh, five years ago, I ran out of those. We've gotten calls from all over the country of people wanting to build their own winner's manuals. And my only uh, recommendation to them uh, is make it yours. You know, don't copy ours. That one was uh, developed by our people. Uh, if you want to use the you know, some of the thoughts and the, and the concepts, fine, but really it will be more value to you if, if you build it. And uh, in my basement, I have, gosh, probably 40 or 50 different high school or other college winner's manuals, some of which you can tell are totally unique to what they've grown to believe and what people have uh, invested in theirs. And others are a little bit uh, lazy in my mind that, uh, you know, they took a little bit of ours and and uh, said it became theirs, and and uh, but there was a real evolution there, and and uh, except people who have said that it has added value to their lives. Yeah, from a coaching perspective, um, it, it's amazing that we do position manuals, and we we talk about you know how to be a running back, a linebacker, whatever, and, and sometimes that culture piece we we don't give it the same. Um, you know, substance in our program or, or we're more haphazard with it. Um, so what have you seen over the years as being like some of the positives that have come from having this very structured, like this is how we're going to build culture? Like what are some of the benefits that came from that? You know, I think we suffer from the same thing in general education as well. We do a great job of teaching mathematics and history and English composition and so forth, but do we really pull it all together and work as well as we could the whole person? Uh, so our belief was that we certainly wanted to win football games. We did not apologize for that. We were hired to coach football, uh, but we felt we were hired to help young people grow. And so what I've seen uh, as a kind of a I guess that what the winner's manual has accomplished, if you will, in people's lives is that it really isn't much about football at all. Uh, it's what they learn uh, about themselves as people, uh, spiritually or morally or ethically, or what they learn about themselves as uh, living gratefully and, and serving and caring for others. Uh, of how to set goals, how to measure yourself, how to progress. One of the areas life and the block of life, they were both exactly the same, uh, was in developing those health habits. You know, every student athlete wants to get bigger and faster and stronger, there's no question. And I don't think anyone questions what impact that has on how good you will be as a player or a team. And so certainly strength programs have really blossomed in nutrition and, and training me mechanisms and so forth. But what we were trying to develop was not just how could we become bigger, stronger, faster, in better condition, better football teams, more explosive, more powerful, all those things. Um, we wanted our guys to develop health habits for life uh, because we tell people all the time that it's probably going to benefit you more financially to be healthy than maybe what your job is. And now, as you've seen the evolution and the cost of health care, 
any business or industry will tell you that the most difficult part of being sustainable and making ends meet is being able to afford your health benefits. And when you talk to families and so forth and that are filing for unemployment or whatever it happens to be, it's, it's the health benefits you know, that are so critical. Well, if that's the case, then your health habits are really going to make a difference for you. And, and so whether it be uh, having that discipline in, in the health area or having that discipline in growing spiritually or having that uh, discipline to not just focus on yourself, but focus on others, uh, those types of things. That's what I've seen as the result of our people studying hard their, their winner's manual and creating their own life's winner's manual. I don't pretend that these are the only six areas. These are, were just the ones that we thought fit subject in school, whether it was Youngstown State or Ohio State, the favorite subject was football. I mean, there was no doubt. That's what they enjoyed the most. That's what they were passionate about, which is fine. But in our academic part of the Block O, we wanted to help them understand that while football might be their favorite subject, they will grow in all of their areas of life if they try to be the best student in all of their other subjects. And then, of course, they'd say, oh, coach, I, you know, I'm taking this intro to biology. I'm not going to be a doctor. What's this have to do with what I'm going to do the rest of my life and so forth? And, and sometimes we just have to say, hey, you know what? There are certain things that you have to get done. And biology might be one of those things that we see if you're tough enough to handle biology. Just like, are you tough enough to handle conditioning in the summer or whatever it happens to be? Work to be the best you could be to permeate every single thing you do. And uh, one of the goals we had, Brent, when we got to Ohio State was we wanted to be the best academic team in the Big Ten. And, you know, that wasn't going to get a bunch of hoopla. USA Today wasn't going to write about that. People weren't going to, you know, make that as, as the primary thing they looked at. But we said, let's, keep, let's become the best at everything. Let's win the Big Ten championship on the field. But let's also, at the end of the year, have more academic all Big Ten players than anyone else. Why not have that goal? And we set out to do that. And within two years, uh, we for the next eight years, we had the most academic all Big Ten players. And, and uh, you had to have a 3.0 to be academic all Big Ten. You had to be a letter winner. Um, and so it wasn't like, well, just some of the guys that weren't playing much had good grades. Our guys that were on the field were achieving as much as in the classroom and those kinds of things, being the best everything, being the best sibling, being the best friend, being the best husband, the best father, the best teacher, the best whatever, there's value in trying to become the best you can be. Yeah, that's uh, great advice. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the uh, strength training or health, you know, and they talk about evolutions in football and they say, you know, the weight room was this great evolution and now everyone has a good weight program, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying this culture training or leadership development is kind of that next big wave. So, um, you know, can't, can't say the wearer's manual uh, enough as a resource. Um, all right, let's... Uh -huh. There's, let me add one thing, Brent, yeah. because it's been interesting. I'm old enough now. This is my 45th or 46th year in watching in higher, uh, watching players be recruited and so forth. I've noticed about the six components in the block goal of life. If the focus is too much on one, you're not going to grow in the others. You want to be competitive in everything you do. And one thing I've noticed is that sometimes we've allowed the weight room to turn into a, a sport of its own as opposed to a way to benefit all sports. And it's funny, I, I watched the NFL draft a, a year ago. I don't know what it was this year, but a year ago, I think uh, 225 of the 250 some guys drafted in the NFL were guys that played more than one sport. They weren't guys that said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play football and then I'm going to spend all my time in the weight room competitiveness in a, in a broader way, I think can be uh, so impactful. That's why we had all those components of the block O of life was absolutely that development of culture, which really is the development of each individual, having each individual grow as a selfless team member, as someone who cared about others, as someone who could become a part of a, of a group. And uh, there's no question. I think uh, I'm hoping that's 
one of the biggest tidal waves coming in. Now the fact that you have it on an app, uh, you know, that will resonate with uh, today's student. Yeah, that multi-sport athlete piece that you discussed, um, you know, having coached and had players recruited by your staff, I know that was always one of the first questions that got asked. What other sports does this guy play? Um, so, yeah, definitely right there. There's no substitute for competing and winning. Um, you know, the first thing, Brent, we looked at uh, when we when we recognized that someone had talent enough, I always liked to check their transcript to see how many days they were absent and how often they were tardy. Because a great culture, a great team member is there early, is there always. And if all of a sudden you look at a transcript and you see someone who was uh, regularly tardy for school or regularly missing from school, uh, we wanted to be the best. We couldn't be late and we could never be missing. And uh, those things, I think, all also add to the culture. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit here. Um, so, Coach, it, it's funny. You mentioned Bobby Carpenter, who we, we've done an interview with. Uh, people can find uh, the link on our YouTube channel. And he actually mentioned the man in the glass. I know. He was mad at me. <laughs> uh, we've also interviewed PJ Fleck, and uh, he mentioned the idea of Paradise is where I am. Um, so obviously, you know, your, your sound bites or what you're doing, it, it sticks with these guys. Um, so one of the biggest questions we get is how do you develop that staff? Because we look at your track record and you have, I think, uh, 10 guys that have coached at the Division One level that as head coaches that used to work for you, countless assistants. Um, I mean, it, your coaching tree is amazing. So how do you develop these guys? And what do you do to make sure your voice or your vision is what shows up in their individual, you know, meeting rooms? Let me, let me answer the second part first. Uh, I think the things that resonate with people, part of their belief system and their culture are the things that really make sense to them and that, uh, that they have some ownership in. Uh, you, let's take your example of P.J. Fleck. Well, P.J. was a guy that he, I mean, as you know, you can tell his motor is, is on full speed all the time. And he was that way as a young person. He's still young, but I mean, as a real young person. So his junior year of college, he had one of the assistant coaches at Northern Illinois calling me up to say, hey, someday this guy's going to be a coach and he wants to be a GA someday. And then his senior year, the assistant coach from Northern Illinois, who I went to college with, kept saying, hey, you got to hire this guy. And I said, well, you know, we don't really have an opening. And I let my position coaches pick the GAs. No, no, I'm telling you, got to hire this guy. Well, we'll see. And PJ went to the 49ers, and so he wasn't available. And one thing led to another, and timing again happened that we happened to lose a grad assistant just at the time he was leaving pro football. And so he got to Ohio State, full speed ahead, constantly wanting to talk about how he could progress. And so we were sitting in my office one day, and he was going over his goals. He said, hey, by the time I'm 35, I'm going to be a Division I head coach, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to be at this kind of level or, you know, whatever. And, and from that day when we started talking about focus on the moment, keep your mind in your rear end or your feet in the same place, whatever, however you say it, um, and paradise is where I am, the more you think that way, the more you'll have a chance to progress. And that resonated with him. And he grabbed a hold of that and, and he held that to help to progress. And so, um, you know, developing uh, the things that at the right time make sense based upon the way that your student's thinking or the way that a, an assistant coach is thinking. You need to meet them where their minds are. And not everything we talked about with our people resonated because it just, maybe the timing wasn't right. Maybe it didn't make sense to them. Um, but, but I think that's critical. Going back to the first part of your question, uh, developing the staff. The greatest lesson, Brent, I learned about that was <clears throat> when I was leaving Ohio State as an assistant coach to go be a head coach, 
I was like every other first time head coach. I had this long list of guys that if, if I ever get a head coaching job, I'm going to call them. Well, then I got to Youngstown State. <clears throat> I had my long list. I, I was thinking about who could coach who could where, you know, all that kind of thing. And, and the athletic director was Joe Malmazor. Joe was a longtime Division Three head coach and, and had become the athletic director at Youngstown State. And he said, hey, young man, when it comes to building your staff, slow down. And what you want to do is not bring a bunch of gurus here that think they're magicians in coaching football. You want to bring a bunch of good people here that need the competencies of coaching, no question. He said, but you must make sure you bring the right kind of person. They'll learn the X's and O's. The X's and O's are the least of what you want to think about. And he used a little story that I've shared with a lot of guys getting ready to do their head coaching thing. He said, it's like when you're building a house. He said, you wanna make sure you don't just hire some <clears throat> uh, actor who comes in and, or a hotshot electrician or a, a egotistical plumber or a, a drywaller who is you know, not the right kind of person because they might be good at their task, but they're not gonna work together with the rest of the subs to build a good house. You want to bring in a good person who happens to know how to do the foundation. You want to bring in a good person who happens to know electric. You want to bring in a good person who happens to know how to plumb. Because when you build a house, things have to happen together. This has to get done first. The other person has to respect the timelines of the other person. It is a complicated thing to build a house. He said the same is true with building a staff. Don't bring in a bunch of self-proclaimed geniuses who think they invented the X's and O's and the system in place stoppable. Because really, when it comes down to it, you're only going to be able to do what your players are capable of doing. And it will take the right kind of person to get to know their players, to learn what their players can do, to then build the house or build the program or build the offense or build the defense the way that it's best to do with the talents of your players and the right kind of culture built into it. So uh, that's been something I, I think back to that conversation I had. Um, and, and that's why when I got here, I really went slow and I ended up with a young Mark D'Antonio was on that staff. A young Jim Bowman was on that staff. A young Don Treadwell. I knew those three guys. I had coached Don Treadwell at Miami. I knew what kind of human being he was. I had worked with Mark, what kind of human being he was. I had worked with Jim Bowman at Miami. I knew what kind of human being he was. And then I also had Ken Knatzer, who was with me for 15 years in Youngstown and then one year at Ohio State before he retired. I knew him because we were together at Syracuse. I knew what kind of person he was. And so building a staff is about bringing the right kind of people who believe in the things that you're trying to develop in coaching the whole person who wants to win. You know, we never apologize for wanting to win, but the harder we worked on the other things, the more we sustainably win. And we thought that that was important, but creating that staff, one of the things when we would talk to our coaches all the time and they'd say, well, I want to go to the NFL or I want to be a head coach at this kind of level or, whatever. And I still have administrators today who think, oh, I want to go to a major R1 university or whatever. It's not where you coach. It's not where you work. It's with whom. That's what makes for a fun career. If you're with the right kind of people, thinking the right kind of thoughts, the right intentions in mind, then you're going to get through the ups and downs. You're not going to win the championship every year. You're not going to be as good as everyone wants you to be every year. But if you can be building the things that you know you believe in with the kind of people that you know will be right alongside of you, that's a coaching staff. Those are uh, great pieces of advice, Coach. Um, all right, final question. We asked this one of everyone. So 
you've seen high school programs all over the country and web would be. So what are some of the things that when you walk in that building, you know, take, take the, the great athletes out of it, but you just walk in that building and you say, man, this is an elite culture or this is an elite program, an elite building. You know, what are the things that you see that make that um, impression in your head? You know, I think the thing that sticks out to me the most is, you can tell when you walk into a program if the program understands that they're just a part of the whole. Do they really believe that they're there on behalf of the community? Do they really believe that they're there on behalf of the school? Or do they think it's just about them? And if you can tell the ones who community is in the, in the school itself is, you know, every other program's important, every teacher's important, uh, behaving in the hallway is important because it's about all of us. You can tell, you go into some of the parochial schools and you can tell, you know what, it's about what we can do for the institution and in their case about the church, that, that, that they're built in, that it's, it's bigger than them. And they will be the ones in my mind that will sustain. There'll be other programs that will be successful on short bursts, maybe because they get talented people or, or whatever it happens to be. But the ones that sustain the, the programs that you walk into the high school and you say, man, this place, whether there's been one head coach there for 30 years or four head coaches there at seven or eight years apiece, you can see that this program knows that it's just that school. It's just a part of that athletic department. It's a part of that community. And their thoughts are constantly, what can we do for the good of the whole? That's when you know that there's a great program that will be a great program over time. Great answer, coach. Great answer. Um, all right. So uh, that concludes my questions. Do you have any closing thoughts for our audience? Well, no, other than you know, this has been a kind of a crazy couple months for all of us. Uh, one of the upsides uh, that I've seen to this is there's a lot of people trying to grow despite being locked in or, or whatever it happens to be. And thank goodness we have technology where I can't, I've been on podcasts with coaches, you know, and I was just on one Saturday morning with staff in Colorado. I've been with them in Georgia. I've been with them all over Ohio later this afternoon. I, I hate to do it. I, I, I don't know if it's a good decision, but I'm going to be on a, a Zoom with the uh, Michigan High School Coaches Association, which, you know, I'm going to wear my red sweater vest, though, because, you know, I, I can't. Uh, uh, but you've taken advantage of this time to grow. And what's neat about what you're doing, Brendan, with your program is now you're putting it out in an app form that you can add value to a lot of people that aren't anywhere near you. Your young people aren't afraid of, of uh, technology. And, and, you know, whenever you ask them about something, I have a group called the Presidential Mentors. And we talk about a lot of different things. And half the time they say, hey, Mr. President, you need to get an app for this. And that way, that will that will add value to our students. And so, applaud you for what it's one of the upsides. We're going to grow. I tell my people here at Youngstown State all the time that 36 months from now, this is going to be a far greater university than it's ever been. The next 36 months are probably going to be painful. There's going to be some tough times. There's going to be some growing. There's going to be some sacrifice. There's going to be some times when we don't get to do some of the things we like doing, but believe 36 months from now the world's going to be a better place the state of ohio is going to be a better place and youngstown state's going to be a better place and i've got to believe that uh westerville central is going to be a better place well coach i appreciate the kind words we appreciate your time uh anyone watching this that would like some more content uh please check out the youtube channel also uh, check out the app titan leader